Ho, ho, ho! Hello, my name is Jose Luis and welcome to a new uh, algorithmic modeling challenge where, because it's Christmas is approaching very soon, uh, we're going to... Wait! <laughs> because Christmas is approaching very soon, we're going to do a couple videos on Christmas theme geometry, with the first one being we're going to model a Koch snowflake or a Koch star, however you want to call that. And what does that look like? A Koch star is... Uh, a subdivision is a fractal subdivision algorithm that given a geometry, for example, a triangle, divides that, uh, that geometry recursively in a smaller triangle and a smaller triangle and a smaller triangle, etc., etc., creating this sort of like a uh, snowflakey geometry that um, has inspired me for this Christmas piece that we're doing. Um, in, I'm going to be... Uh, what's interesting about this algorithm is that you can apply it to perfect equilateral triangles and it creates this nice snowflake form. But you don't really need to bound yourself to perfect triangles. You can apply that algorithm identically to any kind of polyline. And then that subdivision rule still applies the same, which I think is super interesting. All right. Now, um, the way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to implement this uh, I'm going to implement this geometry algorithm in two different ways. First, I'm going to be using vanilla grasshopper. So I'm going to be using um, um, just out of the box components inside of grasshopper and Rhino, which are a 3D modeling environment that has a parametric visual programming language that is very popular among um, computational designers. But then, because this model, Grasshopper, has limitations about how you can do recursion, in order to do that recursion, I end up needing to just basically copy-paste the whole thing four times to do four subdivisions. So in this first part of this video, I'm going to be implementing this in vanilla Grasshopper, but then in the second part, I will take the same logic and the same um, uh, algorithms, and I will implement them using a C-sharp scripting component inside of Grasshopper as well, which will allow me to do this recursion and control how many levels of depth I want to subdivide the curve in, in a programmatic way. Okay, so if you're interested in pure Grasshopper, you probably want to check out this video. But if you're interested more in C-sharp scripting, uh, you probably want to check out the second one. I will be explaining the logics of the subdivision in this one. Um, and I may repeat it or not for the second one, but if you want to learn how to actually do this and what the Koch snowflake is, stick around to this one and then you can jump onto the second one. All right. All right. Let's get busy. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> okay. So what we're doing today is going to be the Koch snowflake or as it has like many other names, the Koch curve, the Koch star, even I just found out that it's called the Koch island. I don't even know why that's, I like calling it the Koch star. Um, that's my preference. And it turns out that um, what we're doing today is basically a fractal shape. Uh, fractals are shapes or geometry or curves that are basically done by taking the elements of a curve and subdividing it into smaller elements that contain somehow the notion of the larger shape that they are coming from, more or less, all right? But the interesting idea about fractals is that you can keep doing this process over and over again, almost infinitely, and that subdivision that you start getting creates more complexity in the shape that you are working with. So the Koch star was one of the earliest fractals that was documented and was uh, discovered in a way. I think it was discovered by Helge von Koch. I'm not sure who this gentleman was uh, earlier in the 20th century. But what's interesting is that the basically what the idea is, is that you start with a triangle and then you subdivide each one of the sides of the triangle and you generate like this tiny attached triangle uh, to it. And if you keep doing that for every new smaller side of this shape that you start getting, more triangles, more triangles, etc. Then you start the discontinuous subdivision of the segments of this polyline into smaller triangulations creates this complex form that starts getting more and more definition and more and more tiny segments all around. Um, and it's interesting because if you do an infinite Koch curve, then basically you can start zooming, 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 and you get a periodic pattern 
that starts arising because the geometry is basically the same. It's just subdivided at smaller scales. If you, we were to do this infinitely, right? Uh, we're not going to do it infinitely here because we have limited resources, but I will show you how to create um, these subdivisions with a control amount of levels of subdivision. All right. And something that we're going to do is also we're going to create uh, the Koch anti-snowflake, which is basically instead of subdividing the, tr the triangulation and creating the triangles popping out, then you can create them popping in. And then it creates this interesting shape that I don't know, it can be. But moreover, what I would like to also um, showcase is that we are going to be working with a triangle. But in fact, the algorithm just works exactly the same. It doesn't have to be a triangle. It works exactly the same with any polyline whatsoever. Because at the end of the day, what we are doing is we're taking a polyline, in this case, a triangle, but it could be anything. And to each segment, we are subdividing it with this triangular form. So we could just apply that logic to any single polyline that we could uh, think of and start getting this Koch subdivision logic on this shape. Okay, so we're going to do that. Um, and but as usual, before we actually start doing it, let's, um, let's do some sketching. And let's think about which process we're going to follow to generate the shape. And then we start getting hands on. Okay, so let's start by the beginning. Um, we have a triangle. But again, uh, anything, everything that I'm going to say applies to any polyline in general. We have a triangle, uh, which is composed of three lines. But at the end of the day, we don't really care about lines. We've, you've heard me say this a lot. This triangle, if we think of it in a more abstract way from a polyline perspective, is just basically a sequence of points, a sequence of order points one after the other. So we can think about this triangle as four points. So point zero, one, two, and then point three again which is on top of point zero, which is the one that closes the polyline on top of itself, we can think of this polyline as four points, a sequence of four points. And therefore, what we're going to do is for each pair of these two points, zero and one, one and two, and two and three, we're going to apply a subdivision algorithm to find this triangulation. All right. The idea is that we're going to create one algorithm that is going to take two points and is going to create the all the points that are necessary to create the triangular subdivision. And then we're going to apply that algorithm to all the segments of this polyline. And what is that algorithm going to work, going to look like? Well, basically, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to subdivide each one of those segments into, uh, into thirds. So we're going to subdivide it into thirds, and we get two points that are at one third and two thirds of the length of that segment. And then after that, we need to find the point that is here, the point that is at the tip of this triangle. The way we're going to do that is we're going to find the point in one of those segments that is at the center, so at 0 0.5 relative to the length. And then we're going to move that point perpendicularly to that line, uh, a control amount. So we're going to move it outwards, or when we do the anti-snowflake, we're going to move it inwards, and we're going to move it perpendicularly, all right? How much are we going to move it perpendicularly? Well, it turns out that this, so yeah, so that the point shows up there. How much? Well, it turns out that because these are equilateral triangles, they have the same side, um, there are very control rules about how equilateral triangles uh, work. And the idea is that if I have a triangle that has the size of A, its height is actually equal to um, the size of the triangle, the side of the triangle, times the square root of 3 divided by 2. And this can actually be very simply uh, found out if we think that if we think that this angle is this angles here, whoop, where am I here? If we think that this angle here is an angle of 60 degrees, because it's an equilateral triangle, and therefore, this is the sine of that angle. And the sine of 60 degrees is square root of 3 divided by 2. OK, you can Google this. It's very simple. Uh, it's very simple to find. All right. So as we move that, then we can create now the polyline that goes around all those points by just uh, in order, um, taking 
the first point, then the second point, then the point in the middle that we just moved, the third point, and then the first point on the second segment, the, all those points one in sequence. So we will do an exercise where we will have to be very careful about the order in which we join all these points together. Now, I have skipped a little bit over the idea of this perpendicularity. This perpendicularity will be something that we need to work, we will need to work on because we will need to find what to this segment and to this segment and to this one, what is a vector that is perpendicular to that line. And how do we do that? Well, imagine we have a, this triangle in three-dimensional space and we're going to assume that it's planar, okay? For these calculations, we're going to assume that it's all the, all the points all of the polyline are in the same plane. If they weren't, um, I'm going, I will show what would happen. But we're going to assume that they're all in the same plane. So if we're on the same plane, we can assume that there is one vector that is perpendicular to that plane. So what we can do is for each one of these segments, right, for each one of these pairs of points, we can find the main axis, the axis vector, which is the vector that joins this point with the other point. That is the main axis. And we also have the global perpendicular vector to the whole polyline. It's a vector that is pointing outwards from the plane in which all those points are connected. If we have those two vectors, it turns out that if we do the cross product of those two vectors, remember the cross product of, an, of two vectors is a vector that is perpendicular to um, to the two vectors, and it has uh, a length that is equal to uh, <coughs> the area of the parallel, parallel of the area of the parallelogram. It doesn't matter in this case, right? So it turns out that if we find the cross product of these two vectors, we find we get a perpendicular vector to those two, and in this case, that is exactly the vector that we need to use to move the point at the center of the segment outwards we will need to find a unit vector in that direction and then scale that vector up by the height of that particular triangle. Okay, but we can do that um, for each segment independently because we can control, we know the length of the segment and we know the length of a third of that segment. So that's going to be very easy to do. Now, as I said, in, in this video, we're going to implement all this logic using vanilla plain grasshopper with no scripting whatsoever. And then in the next video that comes afterwards, we're going to implement all these logics using C-sharp scripting within grasshopper. But the techniques and the logics that I just explained apply to any computational design environment that you can think of. All right. So um, I think it's time to get to get busy. Let's go. Let's go and start writing and, and start implementing this. All right. It's going to be super fun. All right, so let's start. The first thing, uh, we're going to go to Rhino and we're going to create a triangle. So I'm going to hit here on Polygon. I'm going to set the number of sides to be three. And then I'm just going to tap zero so that we go to the center. And then I'm going to create a triangle that is going to be whatever side. I don't really care. And I'm going to press F7 to just remove the grid so that I see this clean triangle on my screen. I'm going to bring the triangle as a curve into Grasshopper. So I'm going to add a curve object select one curve, I'm going to choose this one here. And then I can see that if I drop a panel, that I have this reference polyline curve, etc, etc. Okay. Um, all right. And so what is the first thing that I, we're going to do? As per our algorithm, I think the first thing we want to do is we want to subdivide, we want to find what these points are. So the, the points at two thirds at one third and two thirds, we're going to try to find those. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here to curve, subdivide, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to explode this curve. Um, so I think I'm just going to double click and say explode. All right, this component is going to take this polyline and it's going to explode it into the three segments that are line like objects. All right, and it's also going to give us the four vertices of the polyline. And this is very interesting because, as I said, we have the first one, second and third. And the fourth one is a duplicate of the first one because the polyline is being closed on top of itself. All right. As we have that, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of the three segments that are subdivided and find points at one third and two third. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subdivide this curve 
into a control amount of points. And for this one, I'm going to, I'm going to use a panel because um, if I were to use a slider, I don't like using sliders for things that cannot change or should not change. Because if somebody, instead of three, put, would were to put five or seven or whatever here, they would basically break the algorithm. The algorithm would not work as it is supposed to do, right? So <clears throat> I don't really like that. So now I have here for each one of the um, for each one of the curves, I have the four points that are the subdivisions at zero, one third, two thirds, and three thirds. All right, so we're at a good spot. Another thing that I want to do is I want to find the point here in the middle so that I move it outwards. So I can do that by, for example, evaluating the length. So I'm going to evaluate, evaluate a curve, right? And evaluating means finding a point, or finding all the properties of that curve at a particular parameter. Remember that the parameter is this relative length, not exactly, but it's like this um, relative length along the curve that we can use to query properties of that curve. So um, I'm going to query the curve at 0 0.5 because I want the center of the, the curve. And you're going to notice that the point that I get is somewhere very, very here at the beginning. If these were pure lines, I would get a point at the center because pure lines have a domain for the parameter that goes from zero to one. But because these are not pure curves, these are actually line-like curves, which is a little confusing, I know. Uh, it turns out that their domain can be uh, whatever. So I'm just going to say, for example, let, let me see what is the domain of these curves. And you can see that the domain is from zero to 22. I don't even know what that means. So something that we can do is we can reparameterize, reparameterize um, these curves. Can I do that here outside? Yes. So we can reparameterize them here so that their domain goes becomes from 0 to 1. And therefore, I know that a point at parameter 0 0.5 is at the center. OK, I don't like um, changing the outputs. I rather do change in the input, so I'd rather reparameterize here. That's why I just did I did it here just so that you could see it. But I'd rather reparameterize where you need the reparameterize information because if I do it here, then any other cable that I would plug into any other thing would have to be reparameterized, and maybe I don't want that. And then if I need to change this back to normal, then I mess with the rest of the definition. So I'd rather I'd rather mess with inputs than with outputs in this sense. Uh, I don't know if that if that was clear. Anyway, so now I have the points here. I have the points here. And the next thing that I want to do is I want to find the perpendicular vector to each one of these segments so that I can use that vector to move this point a controlled amount. How is that going to work? Well, first of all, the, what I would need to do is I would need to find the um, I would need to find the vector that goes from the starting point to the end point of each curve. I could do that by messing a little bit with the lists here uh, with the four points and then just creating two lists, one that is the starting points and another one that is the end points. But since I already have the segments here, maybe perhaps an easier way to do this is to find the end points of each one of these. So for example, I'm going to say here end points. Uh, I'm going to plug in here the curve. And then you see that I have a list of starting points and a list of end points. So if I now create a vector between two points, with the starting point being the starting point and, the, and B being the end point. Now you can see that I have these vectors that are pointing from the start to the end, which is very difficult to see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here to vector display and I'm going to show these vectors anchoring them in the beginning at the start point. I'm doing this, remember, because vectors can have any location in three dimensional space. So we need to give it an artificial anchor an artificial starting point for the preview of these vectors. All right. All right, great. So we see now that we have three vectors, each one along the axis of the lines. The next thing that I need is remember, I need a perpendicular vector, a per vector that is perpendicular to this plane. 
so that I can do the cross product operation. How can I do that? Well, um, I know that this polyline is right now flat and planar in the xy plane. So I could just simply here just add the c vector and unit c vector and that would work fine. Um, however, because I want to do things a bit more programmatically as, and smartly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to fit a plane through all the points of this polyline. So um, I think I can do that by saying uh, plane fit. All right. So and then I'm going to give it a I'm going to give it a uh, I'm going to give it a bunch of points. So those are going to be all the vertices of the polyline. And you can see that I get a plane that is at the center and is flat. So that's great. And then from this plane, I'm going to deconstruct it so that I can get the normal vector. So this plane, I'm going to deconstruct it. And then you can see that I get a normal vector. And if I render that vector for each one of these axes, you can see that I get this vector that is pointing down. All right. OK, great. So at this point, um, I think we are ready to take these vectors, the vectors that we created for each one of the segments, and then do the cross product between these two vectors and the vector that is perpendicular. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say I'm going to find the cross product between two vectors. But remember, the cross product of two vectors um, is a non commutative operation and the order matters. And it's driven by the right hand rule. So if I multiply this one first by this one, and if we do the right hand rule, turns out that uh, you can you can see it because it's mirror, but it turns out that the point the vector, uh, if you hold it like this, from the first one to the second one, your thumb is pointing in the direction that this vector will take. So it's important that we that we make sure that when we do this, the first vector that we multiply is going to be the axis that we are working with. So these vectors, and the second one is going to be the perpendicular one. All right. With this, we get a bunch of vectors. You see, we get a bunch of vectors that are perpendicular. All right. So this vector is perpendicular to this one. This vector is perpendicular to this one. And this vector is perpendicular to this one. But these vectors are huge. And we actually need normal vectors, we can actually wait, uh, we can actually plot them uh, in the middle points instead, so that it's a bit clearer. You see, this one is pointing there where this one is pointing there and this pointing is pointing there. So that's great. Okay. Um, with a couple of caveats, one is the fact that these vectors are huge, and we need them to be unitized. So the problem was that these vectors, the vectors, the axis vectors were had whatever length, uh, and I need those vectors to be one unit, so that when I multiply the those vectors with one unit with this other vector that was also unit, you know, I get unit vectors as a result, these vectors that I'm getting, these are not unit vectors. So the only thing that I need to do is I need to unitize these vectors, I need to unitize these vectors before uh, plugging them in. So I need to unitize these vectors before I do the operation. And then now, I get nice unit vectors to move my points. Okay. So that's one thing. The other thing is that you may notice you may be noticing that these vectors are pointing inwards, right. And that is because if you remember, it turns out that when I was calculating the perpendicular vector to the polyline, uh, because of the order of the triangles, this order, it turns out that the fit plane ended up um, the fit plane ended up giving me a vector that was in the negative C direction. And because the order matters a lot when I do the cross product, it and it is driven by the right hand rule, it turns out that as opposed to my diagram, where C was pointing up, in this one is pointing down and therefore, the perpendicular vector is pointing inwards. So there's two ways I can go about about that either I flip this vector, or either I flip the curve before I work with this. So I can, for example, just flip the curve before I feed it into this thing. All right, uh, which is not working. <laughs> uh, so maybe that is not 
what we need to do. And uh, or I just hardwire here that instead of just calculating it from from the plane, I'm just going to just feed it manually a positive. Uh, I'm just going to feed it manually uh, vectors that are uh, that are in the right direction. So I'm just going to hard code here a C vector. And I'm going to keep this because I actually want to play with this in the future as a parameter. So, um, so yeah. So now we finally have these perpendicular vectors. We do have the perpendicular vectors. They are unit, uh, which is great because now what I can do is I can scale them up by a control amount, the amount that we just have discussed. The fact that the height, the fact that the height must be um, square root of three divided by two times the side of this small triangle. So the side of each one of these smaller segments. Okay. So let's take um, these vectors, the cross products, and for each one of them, we're going to multiply this vector, we're going to multiply it for the right length. The right length is going to be, uh, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to take each one as per the diagram, we're going to take each one of these longer we're going to take each one of the longer sides of the triangle. We're going to divide that length by three so that we get this length. And then once we have that divided by three, then that smaller length, which is going to be a is what we're going to multiply by square root of three divided by two. All right. Oops. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, what we're going to do is for each one of the segments, we're going to calculate the length. And I forgot, I'm sorry about this, I forgot to drop here some bifocals so that those of you who are not icon people uh, can, can have a better grasp. So we're going to find the length of each one of these curves. Okay. And given that length, I'm going to now divide that by three and multiply by square root of three divided by two. Um, I would do that with regular grasshopper components, but I actually, because it's a lot of typing, I like the expression component better because it just lets me write here as one expression, the fact that I want to take whatever is coming into this component, and I want to divide it by three. And look how I am typing 0, 0.0 to make sure that I'm not engaging into integrate division. I want a I want an actual I want an actual um, I want an actual I want precision, I want decimals, all right. And then I'm multiplying, I'm going to multiply the result of this by uh, the square root of three. How do I do the square root? If you go here to the functions, you can see that it's a breakdown of all the mathematical functions that the expression component allows us to use. If you go here, you can see that there is, there is a square root SQRT. So it turns out that I can just type here SQRT of whatever. So this is going to be the value of three, and then divide this by and again, I'm going to type here 0, 0.0 to make sure that I have decimal precision. Now I want to point out something I have used here parentheses. And and this is absolutely unnecessary, because this operation could have done exactly the same without parentheses. I'm just doing this for the sake of visual clarity to explain the concept of like, this is the length, this is a third of the length, and then that is what we're multiplying by blah, blah, blah. But it's actually unnecessary because of the order of uh, the operands that we're working with. All right. So we have this for each one of the length. And you can see that the three of them are the same because it's an equilateral um, triangle. So that's great. And now what we're going to do now is we're just going to multiply these unit vectors, the perpendicular unit vectors by these values. So I'm just going to multiply um, these vectors by and I get longer vectors, which if I represent here, you can see that the vector, can we take a look? Oh, it kind of looks like this forms a, a perfect uh, uh, equilateral triangle, right? So great. So now we can just take those middle points, and then just move them with, I'm going to take the middle points, and I'm going to move them with these vectors that I just created. All right. And I think I'm good. I have everything that I need now. I have the points, the subdivided points. 
I have the points in the middle. And now it is now everything that I need to do is just going to be about taking all those points and make sure that I combine them and mix them in a way that um, is perfectly ordered. All right, because remember, for the polyline to work, I need to go from here to here, and then this one in the middle, and then this one and this one, etc., etc. So that is going to take a little bit of like list manipulation inside of Grasshopper. So um, let's take a look at how we could do that. All right, let's take a look here in this component. What we have is if we plug a panel, and this is super, super useful anytime you're doing data manipulation in Grasshopper, panels are your friends and you need to keep them handy to see what's going on. In this panel, we have three branches where each branch contains four points. And each one of those four points are going to be the starting point, one third, two third, and the last one of one segment and then the same for the second segment and the same for the third segment. And you can see that this actually makes sense because this last point of the first segment is the same one as the first point of the second segment. And the last point of the second segment is the same as the first point of the third segment. And this one is the same as this one. So it kind of makes sense. All right. So the only thing that we need to do in order to get all these points plus the point the out pointing the one that is pointing out to get it right the only thing that we need to do is for each one of these three lists in the middle here at the center we need to insert this new point that we have created which we have found we have created just right now okay so we have here a list with the three points that we just generated the problem is that um so we're going to do that with list ins uh, with insert item um, what is that? We're going to do that with, whoop, with insert items. So here, what we're going to do is the insert item component is asking us for the list where we want to insert items. All right. And then it's asking us for the elements that we want to insert. So these ones, and it's asking us for the location. So that's going to be, I want the new elements to show up in position number two. So I'm going to hardwire here a number two. All right. And this is probably not going to work. All right. It's not going to work because it's going to give us something very strange, which is the fact that all these points have been inserted here in a really weird way. The whole list of points, so minus 11, 0 and 11 has been inserted. The whole list has been inserted in the middle, minus 11, 0 and 11 for each one of the three lists which is not what we want, because actually, let me show you, if we were to create a polyline now over all those flattened points, if I were to create it without the flattened points, I would get something very strange. And if I were to create it over the flattened points, I would create, I would have the same strange thing. So this is not going to work. It's not going to work because it turns out that the structure of the data that is coming out of the divide curve so you see these three branches with the three paths is very different from the structure that is coming out from moving these points outwards outside of the triangle, where we have the three points in one list and the branch has a different name. Because we want each one of these points to go in the middle of each one of these branches, what we need to do is we need to change the structure of this data so that we have one point for each one of the three branches that we have here. And so that if the data matches in structure, then each one of the points will be inserted in each one of the branches differently. The way to do that is going to be super simple. We're just going to graft the data that is coming from this component. And if you remember, grafting is an operation that basically adds one branch to the tree for each one of the items that you have in the tree. So this is what we had before. And this is what we have now. We have each one of the elements on its own branch with a different and every element in a different branch. And if we see, you can see that the structure of these two things, the original and the data that we want to insert, they now match identically. So when we put them together here in this, then the matching is going to be identical. 
and we're going to get one point here at the center, the other point here at the center, and the other point here at the center. And that is going to be great because now if I create polylines, you can see that each one of the polylines, right, each one of the three polylines is in the order that we were expecting. All right. Um, I'm going to flatten this because instead of getting three polylines, what I want is one continuous polyline across all the points. Okay. Um, so which is what I'm getting right now. And you can see that I'm getting a tiny error here that says zero length element was collapsed, blah, blah, blah. This is because if you remember here in this list, we are duplicating points. We have this point that is the same as this one, this point that is the same as this one. So therefore, uh, because we're duplicating, there's like zero length segments, which uh, the component is complaining about. So what we've done is not very, very clean, but it has saved us a lot of data manipulation to make this operation cleaner. So at this point, I'm not entirely dis dissatisfied. Uh, I'm not entirely unhappy with this. Uh, we just got the job done for this one. Um, so I think that's fine. And you can see that now we have basically completed a full routine here. Um, and I'm going to just add here a, a tiny bucket here. And I'm going to deactivate everything, the visualization of everything, because I don't want anything in the middle. Yes. So for this starting curve that we have here, uh, and we can see this a bit clearly if I create a boundary surface, for example, for this original polyline, what we now have created is this other um, polyline that has this subdivision. Okay. All righty. So I'm going to take all of this and I'm just going to wrap it inside. Um, I'm just going to wrap it inside a group. Okay. And this part here is the algorithm that takes a polyline and gives me as a result, another polyline that has been subdivided with the Koch subdivision algorithm. All right. Okay. So we are almost there, except for the fact that we now want to apply this logic, this subdivision algorithm recursively. We want to take this polyline and apply it over and over and over again, as many times as possible. How would we do that in Grasshopper? Well, turns out bad news in vanilla Grasshopper, there's not really a way of doing this because of the way Grasshopper works is that it won't let you take the output of an algorithm, which is the subdivided curve, and then plug it in again as an input. You see, it gives me an error because there is a recursive data stream found. Okay. Grasshopper doesn't let you plug inputs, plug outputs into inputs of that lead to the same output because it would create a cyclical reference and it doesn't let you work like that. Um, there are plugins and there are ways to, um, to bypass this, but I find them a little artificial and a little against the spirit of Grasshopper. So literally at this point, the only real way that you can do that in Grasshopper is by taking this whole thing, the algorithm that um, subdivides into uh, that subdivide, and then just plug in the output into the input again, and then just doing it again. And then the resulting curve, just plugging it again at the beginning and giving it a third iteration. And now taking this and oops, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And then taking this and copy pasting it and giving it a fourth iteration. Um, which is not terrible, but it's definitely not clean and not great. You see, um, uh, and let's, let's do like a fifth one. For example, I'm going to take the whole thing and I'm just going to copy paste it here. And we have the result. Um, and let me do a boundary surface here. All right. Um, and, um, and we get this result. Okay. Um, so obviously this is not great because it involves copy pasting a chunk, big chunk of grasshopper components. And also it doesn't give me a slider that I can use to decide. Uh, I want four levels, five levels, six, six levels of subdivision. You will need to manually copy paste these four, five, six different times, which is obviously not great. Again, I know that there are plugins out there that would let you do this, this in a, in a programmatic way. Um, I'm not interested at this point in talking about those right now, because what I want is actually to show you how this would work 
uh, and how we would be able to control this recursive iteration if we were to actually write this using C sharp scripting. Okay, so um, so this is the result that we got. Um, I just want to real quick uh, do an exercise, which is remember when we decided that the vector should be the unit C vector. All right. So um, something that we can do is we can we can we can decide to not use uh, this vector in one direction by use it in the negative direction. So for example, if I plug in here a minus one value, let's say that we plug in here. Um, yes, let's say that we plug in here the minus one value. And we're going to apply that to uh, let's say that we let's say that we uh, let's say that let's say that we change this vector. And the vector that we use here is whatever we whatever we pass. Alright, so we're going to take that away from the algorithm. And we're going to do the same operation over again, we're just going to plug in here a bunch of times. Uh, I'm just going to copy paste this. Um, just going to copy paste this, uh, like a couple times, like four times, for example, all right. And let's say that now we have this one vector, that is the one that we're using to drive all the generation. Right now, because z is positive, the perpendicular vectors point outwards. But if we were to change this to negative, for example, the whole thing will point inwards. Um, and can I get a boundary? Can I get a boundary surface here? Yes, uh, the whole thing will point inwards and therefore creating this anti um, Koch snowflake of, of sorts, right? Or we can just bring it back to positive um, and, and just keep it like that. All right. So um, that perpendicularity is the one that drives which direction we're generating the, the C, we're generating the, the, the triangle on, and then it can lead us to interesting geometry. And honestly, you could implement something where every cycle of the iteration, you randomly choose whether if the C vector is positive or negative, and therefore whether if the subdivision goes outwards on itwards. And that would create some interesting variations of this Koch snowflake. The last thing that I want to talk about is the fact that we have decided to start off from a triangle. And therefore we end up getting this really nice um, triangular snowflake of sorts. But everything that we have done for this algorithm, there's nothing that necessarily depends on the fact that this geometry that we started with has to be a perfect triangle. Not at all. In fact, if we were to say, well, instead of a perfect triangle, why do I not start off? Why do I not start off from a polyline of any shape? So I'm going to create here some kind of weird polyline, for example, and I'm going to use that as the one that is going to be fed into the algorithm. By doing that, you can see that now, uh, and if I close this, you can see that now, what I have generated is the same subdivision pattern, but over each one of the sides of the polyline. And therefore, I can apply Koch subdivision, basically to any polyline that I can think of. And in fact, it doesn't even need this, um, this algorithm doesn't even require that that polyline is flat. So if I take this polyline, and I now mess with the control points, and I drag this one off plane, and I drag this one off plane, and I drag this one off plane, and I have this volumetric sort of polyline, you can see that I don't get the surface anymore, because it's not planar, but I do get the polyline. All right. So I do get this polyline. It's just that you can see that each one of the segments is basically trying to be as horizontal as possible, because we're using a perfect z vector for calculating the perpendicularity. So if I look, uh, if I had a perfect frontal view, you can see that each one of the lines is trying to kind of stick to the perpendicularity, the horizontality of the z vector, uh, combined with the slope of each one of the segments, which I find kind of cool. All right. So I really like doing these things, because uh, you never know. Uh, I really like challenging algorithms, basically, um, and messing with with 
with what they're supposed to do by default. All right. So I guess with this, um, I would like to I would like to wrap up this first part of the tutorial of the algorithmic modeling challenge, where we have modeled a Koch star. Let me do the Koch star again. Uh, let me get the Koch star again. We have modeled a Koch snowflake using vanilla grasshopper. Okay. So what I would like to do on the next video is I would like to mimic the exact same process, but using C sharp scripting within grasshopper and explain the same algorithm writing um, writing row code. Uh, the interesting thing of that is going to be that uh, because I'm going to be using regular code, I will have structures that would allow me to perform iteration. And therefore, I would be able to control how many levels of depth in the subdivision I can do just with one single slider. Okay, so if you're interested in learning how to do that, um, please continue with the second part of this video, which should pop up um, a link to that should pop up somewhere here as a window, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, but if you don't, if you're not interested in that anymore, thank you for watching this video. And please feel free to subscribe, like this video, turn on notifications, etc, etc. Okay, see you on the next video, hopefully.